Welcome everyone. This is class number seven of the inaugural IBIS Prep UBE crash course. And we just had a really fun time going around and asking questions. Matt and I asking the students different subjects, different levels of difficulty, and just questions that uh, come that came up from the first subjects that we've done. So if we look at our UBE calendar, you can see we've done contracts, torch, property, con law, civ pro evidence. Today is agency and partnerships. Tomorrow is corporations, LLCs. Then we'll do trust wills, secure transactions. And we, like I said, we'll send you a new calendar. We're actually going to do um, MPT on the 25th before we do the uh, 4th of July break. And then crim pro, crim law. And then we'll do family law and MPT. So that's the schedule. And then you'll have one week to review and relax. We keep recommending writing many essays. So that's the schedule so far. And we've done a good job. Contracts towards property con law, civ pro evidence. Those are six of the fundamental subjects. And now we're moving on towards more of the nuanced subjects, um, but they are still heavily tested. So we're gonna do agency and partnerships today. And, oh, sorry. Um, in our drive, we have, MEE materials that include um, business entities and agency and partnerships. That's the outline. Um, there's a question here too? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, the, let's look over the outline real quick. Maybe that's what is in the business entities outline. What'd you say? Oh, it's right they're, next to it. Yeah, they're, they're in each other. <laughs> yeah, they're next to each other. Okay, cool. So as you can see, we have two great pieces of materials um, that will help you, uh, business entities and um, the questionnaire and the outline. The questionnaire you know, is pretty simple, just uh, different pieces. And then the outline, um, if we look at it, it's 26 pages. So. What I'll do is just briefly touch on some of these points and then we'll go over the questionnaire um, and we'll just talk about the points and we'll fill it out and then uh, we'll take a break and then we'll look at some essays. So um, agency, it governs the fiduciary relationships created when the party is authorized to act on behalf of another. The agent acts on behalf of the principal created through mutual assent. The agent promises to act for the benefit of the principal and under the principal's control and limitations and the principal agrees. Does not need to be written. Virtually anyone has the capacity to be agents or principal. There can also be co-agents, co-principals, and sub-agents. Agents who act on behalf of an agent or on behalf of a principal. Make yes. sure we oh, Like, yeah, whenever you start an agency question, you should like, the first thing you should do is this, the rule of how an agency relationship is created. Mutual assent. Exactly. Mutual assent is how an agency relationship is created. Then we talk about the different types of agency, actual authority, right? Um, so for instance, the agent expressly authorized to make a business deal, or they are impliedly or implicitly authorized to treat with other businessmen on the principal's behalf, right? So actual authority can be expressed or implied. Um, actual authority is terminated by death or incapacity, the relation of either party, or change in circumstances. Something heavily tested is apparent authority. Example is the Secretary of the United States is authorized to communicate with foreign officials on the president's behalf. The president recently texted the Secretary of State telling him that he was fired and planned to make an initial official announcement in the next few days. The firing text ended any actual authority the Secretary had. However, all third parties unaware of the text would still believe the Secretary to have actual authority, and so the Secretary would still have apparent authority. Parent authority is terminated when the third party. That example is based on true events. Yeah, the apparent authority is terminated when the third party's reasonable belief in the existence of the agency relationship ends, like when the pu president publicly fires the secretary of state. And then inherent authority. I am um, not heavily tested. Is inherent authority? Yeah. Um, it's just like a famous celebrity's manager has inherent authority to enter the celebrity into contracts and deals and ratification where the agent acted outside the scope of their authority, the principal could nonetheless be able to ratify the acts. Um, like so, what'd you say? They like testing on that. 
they like testing on ratification, right? That out, if they do something outside the authority, you can ratify it. It's similar to contracts where a minor can enter into a contract and then ratify it upon reaching the age of majority. Um, contract principals are generally liable for contracts the principal agent enters into. And in some circumstances, the agent also faces contract liability. The principal and the agent's liability depends whether print disclosed or undisclosed. So if they're disclosed, um, the principal is liable. If it's partially disclosed, where the third party is aware of the agency relationship, but does not know the principal's identity, um, or if they're undisclosed, the party is unaware of the existence of the agency relationship. In these cases, both the principal and the agent are personally liable to the third party in the contract. So that's like, you know, some sort of authority that's not known in entirely to the um, party, then both parties will be liable. If you certainly know that you're acting on the scope of, on behalf of someone else, then the principal will be the one liable, not their agent, um, if it's completely disclosed. Tort liability, um, we talked about in class. Uh, Gabrielle, I'm sure now you know, responded superior, vicarious liability. We talked about the Detour versus the frolic. The detour is when you get a cup of coffee. The frolic is when you, uh, you know, really go outside the scope of your business, and the employer will only be liable for the detour, not the frolic. So, so do liability also. What'd you say? So a principal can only directly be liable for an agent's actions under three circumstances. So direct liability, for so vicarious liability is, you know, you can go through the principal through the agent direct liability is you can just sue the principal for something that under these three circumstances if he negligently hired the agent failed to fire the agent afterwards or failed to properly supervise the agent then you can sue the principal directly and not just vicariously through the agent or employee exactly um, make sure we like oh you're completely unqualified but you know you have a good attitude so i'll take you anyway Sure, you don't know how to run a crane, but I think it's, you look like you know how to do it. You failed to fire the agent after like a very egregious incident, or like maybe they were qualified, but you failed to like do any kind of supervision. Because exactly. these are all like things that the principal is expected to do, not like through the agent. So we have fiduciary duties. Make sure you know this. Agents owe the principals the fiduciary duties of loyalty and care. We have a duty of loyalty. So um, they must put the principal's interest before their own. We have the duty of care. They have to act diligently and carefully. And we have the um, principals owe the duties of good faith. They must deal fairly with the agent, avoid taking action to harm the agent, and they must indemnify the agent for any losses that arise under the course of their relationship. So um, that's pretty much uh, agency outline, short and sweet. But also, um, yeah, to the fiduciary duties, you should know that because that can, that can really come up in any topic. Any oh. topic I mean, corporations, partnerships, agency. Um, You're almost always going to have one of these three on the exam, if not like multiple of them. So that's an agency theory. And we'll go through the questionnaire, don't worry. And look at partnerships. Partnerships, right. um, and that's what we're doing today, agency and partnerships, right, Matt? Yes. And then corporations are, yeah, partnerships are like just assumed, you know, whereas a corporation, you really have to go through the formalities of it. Partnerships are more laid back. If two people are engaged in business activity for the sake of earning a profit, we can assume that's a partnership. So we'll have general partnerships where everyone, where there's general partners who are personally liable and then limited partnerships where some of the partners are limited and they're only liable for the extent of their investment. So we'll look at some of these cool features of partnerships. Rupa yeah, almost usually, all law firms are partnerships. What'd you say? Almost all law firms are partnerships. Yeah, and then a lot of law firms become- There are usually LLPs, like limited liability partnerships, which I think come in later. These um, professional corporations, there's a whole lot of ways yeah, to set up a business. Like are pretty rare these days. You'll see when we do corporations, Ibis Prep is an LLC, which is kind of like a hybrid between a partnership and an LLC. Yes. Yeah. So similarly, I'm probably going to transfer um, or I'm going to switch my my uh, legal entity um, description to an S corporation. 
very similar to an LLC. It's just a difference of how you get there. And we'll talk about these things when we do corporations, but no partnerships are more simple. It's not really, doesn't require articles of incorporation. There's no stocks and bonds, none of those things. It's just people working together for the sake of earning a profit. No writing is required, no formal agreement. There should be an agreement. A partnership agreement would be nice, but um, there's a need to be one. So a general partnership is formed as soon as two or more people associate to carry on as co-owners of a business for a profit. No formal agreement is required. The party's intent may be implied from their conduct. No writing is required. Anyone who is capable of entering into a binding contract may be a partner. A would-be partner who lacks capacity is liable only to the extent of his capital contribution, but the partnership with that person is not void. A partnership formed to achieve an illegal purpose is void. Unless otherwise agreed, no one can become a partner without the express or implied consent of all partners. A partnership may file a statement of partnership authority with the Department of State. They may file. You don't have to file. So how do you prove a partnership exists? Easiest way is sharing of profits. There yeah. can also be title to property held in joint tenancy, parties designate the relationship as a partnership, or sharing gross returns. Definitely, um, I know the definition of a partnership. Yep. Definitely. People carrying on for for a business as co-owners of a business for profit. Definitely know that. Um, when a person by words or conduct represents himself as a part. Partner or another as a partner, he'd be held liable with third parties. Note that a person held out by another as a partner is not liable as a partner unless he actually consents to the holding out. So, different partnership property. Partnership capital is a property or money contributed by each partner for the purpose of carrying on the partnership's business. Partnership property, in its broadest sense, is everything the partnership owns, including both capital and property subsequently acquired in partnership transactions. Under RUPA, titled property is deemed to be partnership property if it's titled in the partnership name or it is titled in the name of one or more partners and the instrument transferring title notes the title holder's, prop, title holder's capacity as a partner of the existence of a partnership. Under RUPA, property is presumed to be partnership property if it was purchased with partnership funds regardless of whose name the title is held. So recognize that if a partnership owns property, the property is, partner, is, is part of the partnership. It's not owned by the parties necessarily, it's owned by the partners, the partnership. So a partner is not a co-owner of partnership property and has no transferable interest in specific property of partnership. Thus a partner's creditor may not reach partnership property to satisfy the personal obligations of a partner. It's important to remember that a partner has no right to use partnership property other than for the benefit of the partnership. So, right, if you have partnership property, you can't just throw your personal wedding there it has to be for the benefit of the partnership so interest in the partnership they have a transferable interest i mean you can absent any agreement the contrary you share equal interest you share equally in the partnership profits and must contribute to the losses in proportion to the share of the profits that's assumed if there's no agreement otherwise you can certainly agree to share profits otherwise so keep in mind that transfer of this interest gives the transferee no rights with regard to the operation of the partnership it merely entitles a transferee to receive profits to which the transferring partner would otherwise be entitled. Also note that a partner may not sell his partner status without the unanimous consent of the other partners. Right, So you can assign your, your ownership stake, but you're not transferring your right to necessarily run the partnership unless you have the consent of the other owners. So partners and co-agents of the partnership, they definitely have um, fiduciary duties, decisions involving Voting matters are majority vote. We talk about duty of loyalty, duty of care. Remuneration, absent agreements at contrary, there's no right to remuneration for services rendered to the partnership, except for services performed in winding up the business. Does anyone know what that means, remuner, remuner, remuneration? Yeah, so, oh, besides me? You could be there. You could be the one because I'm not really sure. Um, remuneration has to do with um, being paid to wind, start winding up. So kind of like as an extra job, a side job that you're working on that. So you're not entitled to those monies. Exactly. exactly. Books and information must be kept at chief executive office. Each partner has a right to inspect and copy partnership books. So legal actions by against partners. Partnership may be sued. Um, the partnership uh, may bring an action against a partner for breach of partnership or fiduciary duty. And a partner may bring an action against a partnership 
or other partners to enforce any right created by the partnership agreement. Um, in general, every partner is an agent of the partnership for the purpose of its business and act performed by any partner, either with the actual parent authority or that is ratified by the partnership will bind the partnership and thereby other partners. That's very important. As I say, it's very important to remember that as agents of the partnership, Partners have apparent authority to bind the partnership to any contract within the scope of the partnership business. If a contract is outside the scope of partnership business, the partnership generally will not be bound unless the partner had actual authority. So this comes up if it's like someone in the truck has the logo, well, they can probably bind them. Or if you have, you know, your name uh, on the on your t-shirt and it says, you know, if Matt says Ibis Prep, he's wearing an Ibis Prep t-shirt, he could probably bind. Uh, let's just say I was prep as a partnership. He could bind us into a contract, even if I didn't want to bind us just because he's a partner or he's holding himself out to be a partner or the person would reasonably think that he was a partner. So look for those types of back patterns. It's also important to note that a partnership will not be bound by a partner's act if the partner lacked actual authority and the person will receive notification of such a fact. Under RUPA, a notification is effective either when it comes to that person's attention or when it's duly delivered. So if Matt and I are partners and um, Matt has apparent authority to bind us to a contract and I call you right up and say, hey, that's not true. Matt can't bind us. Well, then that would be a good way of um, claiming that they're not bound by the contract. So a grant of authority limits a partner's authority to enter into transactions. It must be filed with the Department of State. A grant of authority and a properly filed statement of authority is conclusive in favor of a bona fide purchaser for value. Um, kind of skipping over these things, fraud, breach of trust, these are things that they can be held liable for. Civil liabilities, partners are liable for all contracts entered into by a partner in the scope of partnership business or with authority of the partnership. Criminal liabilities, partners will not be criminally liable for the crimes where the partners committed within the scope of the partnership business unless the other partner participated in the commission of the crime, either as principles or accessories. So now with the partnership's ending, how does it end? We have a dissolution. Um, I'm sorry, we have a dissociation and then dissolution. Dissociation is the change in the relationship caused by a partner ceasing to the associated and the carrying on the business. It does not necessarily result in winding up with the business of the partnership. It just means someone is dissociating. A partner expressed will to withdraw, the happening agree upon event, expulsion of a partner, bankruptcy, death, or incapacity of a partner, the appointment of a receiver of a partner's transferable interest or termination of an entity partner. A partner to the partnership agreement or prior to an agreed upon time or event is liable for damages caused by the wrongful dissociation. Upon a partner's dissociation, his right to participate in management ceases. Also, the partner's fiduciary duties generally terminate, except with respect to matters arising before dissociation. The partnership must purchase buy out the partner's interest at either liquidation or at ongoing or going concern value. A partnership can be bound by an act of an associated partner undertaken within one year after dissociation. If the act would have bound the partnership before dissociation and the other party of the transaction, they reasonably believe the associated partner was still a partner and did not have a notice of dissociation. So even if you're dissociated, you people can you could still bind the partnership by your acts if the other party would think that you were still a partner. An associated partner can be liable for obligations incurred by the partnership within one year. If, when entering the transaction, the other party reasonably believed the associate partner still a partner and he did not have notice of the partner's dissociation. Dissolution is how you dissolve the company um, and wind it up. So, notification by a partner of an intent to withdraw in a partnership for definite term or particular undertaking within 90 days after a partner's death, bankruptcy, or long form dissociation, at least half the remaining partners wish to wind up the partnership. All parties consent to wind up or the term expires or the undertaking is complete. To have an event up, to have an event making the business partnership illegal, or the issuance of a judicial decree that the business is to be wound up. So we understand that dissociation is someone dissociating from the partnership. Dissolution is the process of ending a partnership that turns into a process of winding up. So then we'll have distribution of assets, creditors are paid off first, then partners account. If a partner fails to contribute to the partnership's debt, all the other partners must contribute the additional amount necessary in the proportion which partners share losses. Yes, yeah, so before we go into limited partnerships. 
doesn't seem like people do. Yeah, Wait, one more. Yeah, no, that's go ahead. a lot of information. What was your question, Brandon? Just one more, like, when, so all the partners are liable for all of the torts committed by any of the, the partners? Not intentional torts necessarily, especially if they're outside the scope of the business. Yeah. But, they're liable, inter like, proportionate to their share of the partnership, the partnership is sued. Okay. Civil liability. The liability is joint and several for all obligations of partnership, whether rising contract order for breach of trust. So, however, a judgment is not personally binding on a partner unless she's been served and the creditor's exhausted partnership assets. Each partner is personally and individually liable for the entire amount of partnership obligations with greater contribution identification. An incoming partner is not personally liable for obligations incurred by a partnership before the person became a partner. An outgoing or associate partner remains liable for obligations arising while he was a partner in the partnership and contain, continues until 90 days after he's filed notice of dissociation within the partner state. So to answer that question, so I was a little related to limited partnership. Limited. What's that? What I said was about limited partners only. They're only liable to like their share. Right. And what I said was not necessarily true. You can be liable for towards intentional towards as long as you're within the scope of the business. And it's like, um, you know, the obligations of the partnership. So, uh, just a bit. so, I mean, just remember that when we have a partnership, you are potentially liable for things that happen um, civilly. So if I'm a partner with Matt and we're both tutors and, you know, Matt is tutoring someone and there's a issue, you know, a tort that arises, I could certainly be liable for it. Same vice versa. Yeah. All right. Let's look at LPs. So limited partnerships. So just know that general partnerships are personally general partners are personally liable. Limited partners are only liable for their stake in their investment. They're not personally liable. So a limited partnership means that um, there has to be at least one general partner, and then there could be limited partners. So um, you could be a general partner and a limited partner, or you could just be a limited partner. And basically, the general partner is jointly and severally liable for all obligations, whereas the limited partner is not personally liable. So limited uh, partnerships have to, you have to file a written form, like with the state, the Department of State in your state. Like, it's not like a, ge so general partnership is a default. You don't need anything to create it except like associating for profit. But limited partnership, you have to file it in writing. Right. General partner, like we said, has fiduciary duties. Where the limited partner doesn't really have the fiduciary duties. Um, the general partner has the management duties, is really on top of things. A limited partner is more like an investor. Um, I'll kind of skip over this so you can do the questionnaire, but just so you know the, what they are. LLP has at least one general partner and it could have limited partners. Um, an LLP um, means that there's everyone is a limited partner, right? The major advantage of operating as a partner as an LLP is a partners are not personally liable for the LLP obligations. So that's just like, in, instead of an LP, I mean, yeah, instead of just a limited partnership, where there's a general partner and a limited partner, we could have an LLP, which is all the partners are limited partners. Pretty simple. So what might be like the benefits of having like a general partnership versus only limited liability partnership and like a limited partnership in general partnership the advantage is there's more control between the general partners um but it's also opens you up to more liability yeah and also like it's much cheaper to like all you have to, you don't even have to do any paperwork you can just it's just created limited liability is ba i mean it's basically better to have less liability i think it's just the general rule so limited liability partnerships are generally better in most cases, but like it's more expensive, time consuming to create, especially if you're running like a very small operation, mm -hmm. like a lemonade stand or something. All right. So we're just going to do the questions that have to do with partnerships. Um, what I'll do is sorry, make a copy of this.
Um, and we'll just answer the questions that have to do with uh, partnerships for now. We can do them you know, pretty rapidly and then we'll take a break and then we'll come back and we'll look at some uh, essays that specifically have to do with partnerships. And Matt, do you have maybe two of them that are specific oh. partnerships? Yeah, I have a few that I can think of that I'll find. All right, bet. So general partnership, we said um, all general partners, right? And how is it created? Does anyone know? A general partnership? Yeah. You just, you guys, no, not necessarily any, um, any agreement, you guys, you guys just uh, work. Work for what though? Um, work for a business uh, as co-owners of a business for profit. Yeah, wow. exactly. Like the main thing, I got it for profit. So we talked about the formation of partnership and business ends above, how they different from each other. I mean, this is all, we talked about this, but I would encourage everyone to literally just spend some time researching LLPs, GPs, and LPs, and just learning the ins and outs of them. I mean, they're not that difficult, and you know it's going to be tested. So, um, you know, what would you say, Matt? Is there any important points here about formation requirements for the various business entities above and how they differ from each other? Um, but only for the partnerships? Um, yeah, so for limited partnerships and limited liability partnerships, you need to file, like, specific forms, and I think that probably depends on what state you're in. Um... Oh, oh, the second question. Um, yeah, what I just said, how do they differ from each other? Well, I mean, the main thing is in terms of liability and also the number of partners, or not number of partners, but the types of partners, excuse me. General partnerships, you can only have general partners. Limited partnerships, you need at least one general partner. Limited liability partnerships, you don't need any general partners. Exactly. General partnership, all general partners. Limited partnership, at least one general partner. LLPs, all limited partners. And they differ from each other in terms of liability and management, LLPs and LPs require filing certain forms. Simple as that. What are the roles and responsibilities of partners, directors, and officers in a partnership? We're not gonna do corporation, but just in a partnership. What are the responsibilities of the partners? They are agents of the partnership. They have a duty, a fiduciary duty of care, loyalty. Yep. And good, and good faith. Good faith. And how would you define those fiduciary duties of care, loyalty, and good faith? Loyalty, I would say you have to avoid conflict of interest and self-dealing. Duty of care is act as an ordinary prudent partner would under the totality of the circumstance. And then good faith is your honest belief about the facts. Um, uh, and then good faith is, I would say, put the business interest first. Okay. What we say here? Oh, the business judgment rule. Okay. Well, that's the very next question. What is the business judgment rule? When does it apply? Um, Paul, since you brought it up, why don't you explain it? Paul is saying. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Uh, I think it, basically it just means you have a duty to act prudently or in the best is interest of of the partnership, and that. You won't be held liable. Like if you make a if you make a bad investment, but you did it in good faith, um, because you got counseled by the accountant and it just didn't work out. You can't be held liable. That's kind of how I see it. Right. It'll be you'll be protected if it turns out to be a poor business decision, as long mm -hmm. as it was in good faith. And the reason for that is we assume that you know you're managing a partnership, or whatever. You're forced to make some decisions under fire, and we can't question every decision you make. Maybe you had to take losses and profit because you needed uh good publicity like there's just certain, there's just a lot of important things about running a business that as long as they tried their best basically they'll be uh protected in the business judgment rule um what is what rules do you use when determining whether there's a conflict of interest i think these are more corp i mean i guess they apply to partnerships also yeah i guess too and direct and direct to, yeah we'll skip them you can skip that and do it tomorrow yeah, securities regulation, that's definitely um, corporations. I teach for the Series 7, so this is my jam right here. Um, dissolution, here we go. When does a partnership dissolve? 
when um, when something happens that was agreed upon in a partnership agreement, somebody goes, uh, somebody becomes incapacitated, a uh, law was broken, change of, change of rules. Or someone dissociates. If the dissociation results in, you know, necessary winding down. Yeah, like if it's a general partner and a limited partnership dis disassociates or like a majority partner dissociates and the rest of the partners decide that it can't continue without that person. Yeah, there's a lot of reasons to dissolve partnership. Um, but whenever a partner leaves, like the rest of the partners have to vote to continue the partnership, correct? Yeah. If yeah. Partner. That, like that vote becomes like that like creates or that like necessitates that vote whenever a partner dissociates. Disassociates. Um can the courts ever impose a dissolution of a partnership or corporation? Certainly, right? If it's yeah. perfect, it becomes illegal. Yeah. yeah, criminal. Like Enron. That might not be what happened, but Trump Enterprises. Yeah. We'll talk about Enron we do uh securities. Um I don't or like, know. like a, Equal partner. This is more like a corporation's thing, but like, let's say you have two partners, each with like fifty percent shares, and they can't decide on anything, and they're just like locked, and they can't like even use these assets that they own because they can't agree on anything. Then that's called deadlock, and the court might just like decide to like d dissolve the partnership and just give each person half, like just out of fairness. No, that's fair. Um, what is dissociation in the context of a partnership and how is it different from dissolution? Ooh, that's a tough one. Can anyone answer it? You can do it. I anyone think for, dis for dissociation in the context of a partnership, you, you make it clear and unequivocal that you no longer want to be a part of the partnership. And then what was the second part? Dissociation versus uh, dissolution. And then dissolution is more of, I think, like what you met Gabrielle mentioned earlier, it's the winding up. So the purpose for which the, the partnership existed has been completed. And then you just begin the winding up process, paying off the debts and using the partnership assets and so forth. Yeah, I said winding down. Touch you wind up. Oh. No, you said winding up. I said winding. I was wrong. You're right. Winding up um, and ending the partnership. But it's winding down. Oh, it is winding down. All right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. yeah it is winding down. It is winding down. It's down. It's down. Winding down. Yeah. We don't want to wind up. Winding up is like getting ready to rock. Winding down is. Yeah. I mean, like, like, like you wind down for like you're winding up as part of winding down. But it's it's definitely called winding down. Yeah. All right. All right. All right. All right. All right. And number seven. How is an agency relationship created? Okay. How is it's an agency relationship? Or an acronym or not acronym? Like initials or M A. Mnemonic. Yeah. Mutual assent. Yeah. Right. Yes. Mutual assent. That's a key word according to Matt, and I trust Matt. Mutual assent. Okay. Define different types of agency authority, actual, apparent, and inherent. So apparent, we just, I think we went over the apparent just recently where you said like if a third party does not know of the agency principle relationship or does not, cannot identify the principle. Yeah. And also for, you have actual like express and implied actual authority. Right, Which, that's what it's like. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, it's kind of kind of like the necessary and proper clause. Like the actual authority is what like you're tasked to do, like the Constitution of Congress, and the necessary and proper clause, like let's Congress do things in order to like in order to fill their other powers. So that's, and, so we said that authority. Secretary of State after being fired. Yeah, I like that example a lot, and then inherent. I would just say like also like just being secretary of state or like if you're like the attorney general, like people know that because you're the attorney general, like you have these certain 
these certain like powers, even if like the president never told the attorney general, oh yeah, you can prosecute cases. Or the the president has never told these people that. I like the um, celebrity agent. That was a good example. Yeah, but I guess like also, yeah. I think I said celebrity manager just to like not use the word agent, but I don't know. Oh. Are managers and agents different. I feel like that. No one ever knows. All right. No, that's all good. Um, what does it mean for an agent's action to be ratified? You have me in chat. Ratified, even though it wasn't allowed by them, the company or principal used the action for their benefit and now ratified. Right, so like they accept it after the fact. They approve it. Right. I like what you said there. Um, or approved. And it could be explicit or implicit, right? Like what you were talking about is probably more implicit. Oh, that's not good. Okay. Um, let me see. Um, what duties does the agent and principal or what duties do the agent and principal owe to another? Good faith. Yeah. Is that it? Uh, the agent owes the principal duty of loyalty. Right. And I think the principal, I don't know if it's technically a duty, but the principal is obligated to like recompense the agent if the agent like use their own funds for something in order to like didn't, you, you didn't use like the sandwich example or something like that. I don't even I think last time Matt uh, sandwich. I'm I may have I may have mentioned sandwiches. I don't know. Right. All right. Well, nothing wrong with sandwiches. Um, let's right. see. Can you remember more of that? Because I'm actually interested. Like the guy, I think last time you mentioned that the agent went out and like bought this guy like a bunch of sandwiches for lunch or something like that, and then he wouldn't repay him. I think oh. that was a violation. Yeah. And like, if you tell your assistant, go buy me sandwiches, like your assistant isn't, shouldn't have to like pay for the food. Like they expect to get their money back. When is a principal liable for tort was committed by Is he frozen? No, there's no one's talking. Oh. When is the principal liable for torts committed by the agent? Intentional torts and at the direction of the principal? I like that. Right, like, um, well, especially uh, if you're a, a bouncer at a club that's intentional towards, also within the scope of business, right? Yeah. Excellent. I think it's only intentional towards so long as they were at the direction of the principal, or, or is that what you mean? We're intentional towards when at the direction of the principal, like a bouncer at a club. Yeah. And then um, regular towards. Like negligence. Within the scope of business. All right. Um, what is the difference between an employee and an independent contractor? Everyone's favorite question. So, yeah. Writing independent contractor is in um own, yeah they so independent there's like so many different factors how would like, you do i guess let's go with, let's, wait wait matt let's go with um because i know you have a lot of factors what are the uh, factors for employees yeah so like you just see like you just use look at the factors to see does the employer have control over this person so an independent contractor could bring their own tools um like i have my own, i have my own computer um i, I studied for the bar myself i didn't I wasn't trained oh, by you're him. definitely an independent contractor I was prep. Hundred percent. Yeah. Like I make my own hours. Um facts. I don't drive in an Ibis prep car. Yeah, 1099. No logo. Person. Like yeah, they like they yeah. Basically, 
Just the facts indicate employer employee status. Now, look at the contract. Like, does it say employee or does it say independent contractor? Yeah, that helps. Now, even if, to be fair, Matt signs with Ibis Prep an independent contractor agreement. Matt is paid as a 1099. All these things. Even though he's with all that, he could still be an employee. If yeah. he was like, hey, man, I need you to work nine to five every day in this office, you know what I mean? Then he would still be an employee. But under the terms of how we operate, he's definitely a independent contractor. So there's generally no like hard and fast rule. You have to like, so they will give you facts and you have to like use those facts in the strippers or trying to be employees. So Paul, I, I can't, I can't confirm that. I, I don't know. I haven't seen that. Well, Paul, who also wants to celebrate this exam by going to Ebor City, which Ebor City, City. Is right there in Tampa, so it's not a far place to go. So take the exam and then walk down to the time, place, and manner allowable portion of uh, Tampa. And he's saying strippers are yeah. trying to be employees now to get health care in some states and unions. Just know in f most states, the um, unionization, the power to unionize is a fundamental right and we subject to strict scrutiny. But I know like there's a big thing in California where Uber drivers want to be considered employees and not independent contractors. So if you're like interested in like more about this and like, why wouldn't you be, I guess you could look at that. For sure. When I was, I was one of the first Uber drivers in Florida. When they first came to Florida, I was driving for Uber when I was in school. Um, it was all right. I didn't mind it. Okay. What is the difference between a detour and a frolic? Last question of the day before a break. Good question. We did this, right? Yeah, we did it before the recording. Detour. Hey, so Paul mentioned it was like a slight deviation from what was in the scope of employment, and then a frolic is like a gross deviation from what was in the ordinary scope of employment. Mm, and frolic is gross. Ew. Gross. Actually, instead of going to girlfriend's house, let's say going to Detour <laughs> City to watch dance performances. Right? Yeah, that'd be a frolic. That'd be a frolic employer unless it's within the scope of your employment not liable right all right excellent so we did a lot of this questionnaire obviously we'll come back and fill in the um uh the corporations piece but this was pretty good so let's take a 15 minute break we'll come back at 6 20 and we'll look at two if possible three um partnership agency essays mm -hmm.